About a century ago, Ohio was covered with an extensive system of electric railroads called interurbans. By 1940, the entire system had closed. So, how did this happen? Public transportation at large has gone through a succession of sorts. Canals replaced unpaved roads, railroads replaced canals, and highways replaced railroads. 25 years after George Washington had passed to the immortal, a steam locomotive made its appearance. Railroads sprang up along the old routes of travel. While we may think that the 19th and early 20th centuries were dominated by steam trains, electric interurbans actually provided many Americans with another option. But let's just take a step back. What exactly are interurbans, and how are they different from steam trains? Interurbans are really an extension of the streetcar. The streetcar was developed first, the electric streetcar, and uh, they worked so well that the uh, entrepreneurs decided that they could start connecting communities around the city cities with uh, elongated streetcars, which they called interurbans. Unlike the steam locomotive, which uses force produced by steam pressure to mechanically drive pistons back and forth across a cylinder, interurbans use electric power lines to drive the engine. Compared to steam trains, interurbans were cheaper, faster due to frequent service, and more comfortable. And Ohio, with its flat terrain and evenly spaced out cities and rural communities, was the perfect place for the interurban to thrive. In fact, Ohio was covered in roughly 2,798 miles of track, the most of any state by around 1,000 miles. The interurban in some ways was that transition from steam railroads to the automobile because people would abandon local steam railroads, certainly for local trips, because of the convenience and the expense of riding on an interurban. If you can imagine your commute to work when you used to go to work in a distant place, um, if you could cut that commute in half, all just all of a sudden you, you'd think, boy, I really gained a lot of time. And I think that's the way the locals felt about it. Interurbans made perhaps their biggest impact on rural residents who use electric rail to access city life, recreation, and better schools. In fact, oftentimes when an individual is looking at a farm, said, how far is this from an electric interurban? So real estate prices went up along interurban lines. So let's get back to our opening question. What really caused the end of interurbans in America? A method of transportation that seems so much better than its predecessors. Well, there's a simple answer really, and that's cars. At first, the automobile industry offered little competition to rail due to the cost and fragility of cars in the early 20th century. Soon though, the invention of the Model T introduced a new line of inexpensive cars to the market. There's one car that takes you anywhere you want to go, the Model T. Strong, sturdy, with a will of its own. And when you could buy a Model T, there was just no sense to, to ride in, in urban. You just get in your car and go where you wanted to go, and that, that pretty much ran them out of business. Since World War II, state highway departments have built 163,000 miles of new roads. In the same period, auto manufacturers turned out so many new vehicles that it would require 264,000 miles of highways just to park them bumper to bumper. With the passage of the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1921 and 1956, America began construction of the interstate highway system, which was proclaimed complete in 1992. Interurbans no longer had a place in this new era of transportation infrastructure. In 1938, the final interurban train in Ohio ran from Park Square to Toledo. The interurban era was finally over. Today, discussions about advancing the state of railroads are being recovered across the nation. While the nation's investment in highways far outweighs its investment in rail, there is, however, a glimmer of hope for its future, specifically in Ohio. 
In recent years, the idea of extensive passenger rail service in the Midwest has been revived by a number of proposals, the most recent being Amtrak's proposal for five new passenger rail routes running through Ohio. While this is no interurban system, it looks to a potential future for rail, which may bring us closer to a public transit system in Ohio. Amtrak for the past two years has been saying that there are many regions of the country that are underserved by rail service and by public transportation generally. And that many of those are in areas where there is no rail service now, such as Cincinnati to Cleveland. And their argument is, is that most of the growth in this country is in these urban areas. And what they want to do is to link those urban areas with rail service. But we are slowly but surely moving towards that day of, of a national high speed rail system. Transportation is like anything else. It evolves, it changes, it hopefully gets better. Um, but, but it's not an overnight thing. Those of us that have got kids or grandkids what kind of a world do we want to have for them in terms of how they travel and how they access jobs, and education and healthcare and things like that? That's important to me. Uh, I want my granddaughter to be able to step on a train someday and say, my grandfather helped get this going. The future of transportation rests on the decisions we make today. But as history shows us time and time again, we can learn a thing or two from looking back on our past. And while it's probably going to be a long time until we have a mass transit system, like in the carless future of the 2013 feature film Her, and hopefully never will we ride on a half-frozen bullet train in a dystopian world like in director Bong Juno's Snowpiercer, it doesn't hurt to dream a little bit more about the future of public transit in America. <laughs> <laughs>